So we have uh, plenty of time for questions, and I'm hoping that you took some notes of the things that you'd like to ask our presenters. Uh, so uh, I'm going to open, it, open the floor to questions. Evan reliably has a question. I do have a question. I have a question for all of you, but I'm going to ask Kaylee a question. Um, I, I, so as soon as I saw your slides, I, like my brain just started firing a lot of neurons. Uh, and I'll, I mean, especially with the authorial versus aggregate and other other um, other models, because it, it, in some ways, like they, they interrogate some of the core assumptions and some of my own design and in, in, in other people's design. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, and, on the same road. <laughs> right, yeah, no, exactly. So I was like, holy crap. Um, but 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 my um, my question is is okay. So you've got something. Uh, it's, it's, you, you, you've got the, the, the different texts that the students have read, and you say that this is like a sort of culturally neutral environment, and that there's this, this role, role of dissent. Uh, I, I, I recently read Yako Stenros' dissertation, which is all about like dark play and non-consenting play, and what happens when people bully people. Well, one person's playing, and the other person's not, and that is, it, play is still there, and, it, 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 and in some ways there are, you know, in, in what we say consider to be serious games or Nordic games, you know, serious games or, or Nordic games of that particular progressive um, large level, and they're, they're going to, to incorporate these kinds of, of elements which, which do involve consent culture, but the kind of consent culture is very complex. Uh, how do we introduce that into the classroom, especially with very negative power dynamics that things such as dictatorships do produce? Um, you know, we all have, we all have the, the classic like you know blue eyed Greek brown eyed uh, you know classroom separation experiment. So where it, which which you know if you divide a class and say they're the superior one, then then, then people kids have traumatic experiences for years and years to report them. Um, and but then, but then also you know um, so how do we manage consent and then then how do these power relations? Um, Emerge from either aggregate or authorial, right? It, 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 right, right. It, like, you know, it, 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 the reason why it's incoherent is you've got all these different things going on all at once. Power. Uh, it, it's cultural theory. It's evolving. Yeah, you know, no, it's, exactly. It's, it's, so, at least in evolution. So I'll thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but just real quick, I think, I think we should definitely um, have more discussion about that. And in terms of consent, I do see there being levels of consent in which. You know, in the final unit, we talk about the difference between playing a game and being in a situation in which you don't have the mode of production, or in which the king can cut off your head. And it's like, okay, you may or may not enjoy someone's preformed mark, but they don't have power over your physical body. You know, and, and so having that realization that, um, and, and examining that, saying what would happen if those game experiences we had had this type of power, what would happen if you're not a very good campaign larker means you don't get to eat, you're not getting enough you know, enough sustenance, you know, how, what does it start to look like when you tie in other concepts related to the economy, now that we've established what that play structure looks like, what the performative versus code fluency models look like. So that's, the goal is to like keep focused on that and talk about consent, but also talk about levels of consent, because within within the games, as you know, you've discussed their, their micro um, levels as well that aren't as extreme as one's experience with the political economy, but yes, we should talk more. <laughs> More questions? Uh, just a very quick question for Haley. Could you define critical code studies? Uh, critical code studies uh, would be the examination of code as um, text and code as manuscript. So uh, interpreting and annotating code uh, of all types. In a talk I'm giving on Sunday, I believe it was in games, I'll be talking about how some LARP rule sets are code that run on humans <coughs> based on some definitions we have. <laughs> How about a question for uh, Susan? Oh, we spoke on using simulations for natural selection. Yeah. Uh, one of the things you said towards the end, um, you mentioned that you think simulation works particularly well with um, teaching evolutionary, partly because it uses a lot of modeling anyway. And then you mentioned that you think that it might possibly Simulation might possibly work well with other um, educational scenarios that rely a lot on something that's conceptual. I think was how you said it. I'm, I agree with you, 
and, and I want to pick your brain, what, uh, what do you think, like, what other kinds of education would qualify as conceptual, or what do you mean by that when you say that? Yeah, so I'm thinking of, you know, concept, these sort of conceptual models that we have, um, in, you know, the ones I'm most familiar with tend to fall in either evolution or economics, because we stole our models from economics, um, so, you know, a lot of sort of game theory um, based models and um, you know, these models where you're looking at, okay, so if you've got X number of fitness points and the ones that have, you know, more fitness points are more likely to successfully reproduce, you know, that you can sort of have that as a conceptual model of natural selection without necessarily writing down all of the numbers and, you know, making it a detailed model. I think we use a lot of those in, in evolution, we use those in economics, we also use the, some of those in how the body works. Um, you know, in like how blood pressure is affected by um, heart rate. You know, you might have some conceptual models for that without understanding all of the physics for the details of what's going on. Um, there's also conceptual models in physics of, you know, what, it, what are your conceptual models for, you know, what is going to happen when, you know, if I push this chair, you know, how do I predict what's going to happen when I push that chair? Um, and sort of pulling out, you know, the general forces that are acting without necessarily putting all of the numbers into place. Thank you. Another question for, yeah. uh, for Susan. Um, so you, uh, the students did reflective writing in, in, uh, after one round and then at the end? Yes. Um, was there reflective discussion? Like, did they socially? Yes, we did have some discussion um, at the end after the last round of reflective writing because I wanted them to, in their groups, so that they will, there's, there's group work, mm -hmm. so there's group discussion at, at every section, oh. and then, whole class discussion only at the end because I wanted them to work independently in the groups and then, so independently in the groups, then whole class. Right. So, to, just independent, so, um, wait, individual writing, then, then group discussion, um, then another round, then, then individual more group, writing. The, the second round was only group writing. Okay, only group writing and, and then, then whole, whole class, class discussion. discussion. Okay. So, question from class. Michael, uh, you said something about not really having a, a clear picture of the difference between the students who were subjected to this and the ones before that. Was I either just listening badly, or was there a reason I didn't understand? Will you have more? Will you have more proof <laughs> later? Is the question because it sounded really awesome. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy you think. Um, I don't know. Is the, the uh, short answer? The longer answer is. Um, my sense of how, when I, before I used Sheldon and tried to cre create the, the continuous narrative and the, the character classes and all that, um, it was already a tremendous success for the students, looking at the, the course evaluations, looking at the learning results, um, and, and this goes into fuzzy um, metrics, if you will, such as what's the quality of writing I'm getting? Um, what's the, the, the quality of the classroom discussion? How sophisticated is it compared to when I was doing the lecture based class? Uh, and all that, you know, I was in teacher heaven, right? And, and that was before using Sheldon. And I think Sheldon could uh, just make these tools like 3D Game Lab uh, even more effective. But to calibrate that in a more precise sense, say like uh, Mazur did with uh, peer. Uh, learning, uh, where he could actually present, present some form of metrics, uh, that requires a research design that I've never had available to me. So, and that was one of the reasons why the, the paper that is now under revision was, at the, the first journal I sent it to basically just rejected it precisely because it didn't have the research design, which I couldn't do because I was a grad student, I wasn't allowed to. <laughs> How do I communicate that to my reviewers and so on and so forth? It seems to go better now. Yeah. 
Um, but that's, that's also one of the things that I'll be struggling with. If I'm going to make the claim that Sheldon has potential compared to just 3D Game Lab without Sheldon, I, I need to be able to back that up with something. And right now, when you have a set of students who come in from just lecture-based passive learning, either to just 3D Game Lab or 3D Game Lab plus Sheldon, I, I think they're going to react in terms of enthusiasm in pretty much the same way because they've never been exposed to active learning mm -hmm. or role playing in the classroom before at post-secondary in Pulse uh, And that's going to be an impediment even if I do manage to find the right metrics to do this and I'm not in the field of education, that's why I need those guys. Um, because, because of the preconceptions and because of the lack of uh, exposure to these pedagogical techniques. So that's, that's something I'm keeping in mind for potential research later if that happens. In, in my dreams. Um, so that, that's going to be a struggle that we have to overcome somehow. Uh, but, you know, it would be wonderful to be able to do a, say, three or four or five year uh, shirt sponsored partnership <coughs> where we could actually test these different models against each other and do a really good solid research design. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to people to get us there, but we'll see if it materializes. So, more questions? We've done some work with uh, Lee Sullivan's um, stuff, the game based posture, and um, at least teaching game design students using game based posture. Uh, we, we talked to Lee about this, and he completely disagrees with our assessment. But this is our experience, so whatever. Uh, at least dealing with game design students and game, using the game based posture, they felt like they could see through your office and that they were essentially getting, yeah, okay, so they were building up for an A, but. If they didn't get 100% on this one, it meant that they got a 90%, and that was an A. They did the math, right? Yeah. Uh, did you find that people were doing that, or did you did you have some ways of getting them to buy into the whole program? Yeah, that, that's actually an excellent question. One of one of the things that I'm thinking about, precisely because of, of what all my colleagues were giving and the contrast, um, is how much how much of the enthusiasm that I'm getting from the students here is because it's something new they haven't seen possible for me to tell. Um, I know the only thing I can say about that is that at this stage, purely anecdotal, purely talking to students, is that um, there was kind of a in every class where I've done anything 3D game lab based, shallow or not, uh, there have been a few different reactions. Um, there would be one or two students who hate this and thinks this should never happen in a classroom because lectures is the way to teach. Um, and uh, there will be a smaller group of students, I'm just taking numbers out of the air here, but say 10, 20 percent, who will be super enthusiastic from day one, probably because they actually are gamers to begin with and they are so familiar with the interface and the jargon. And then there will be a whole bunch of people who are quite confused who are also somewhat skeptical because games, what's that, and so on. But after a couple of, of weeks, or at least by the middle of the term, they are enthusiastic by that stage because they, they see the asynchronous potential. Uh, but even with the, the, the uh, gaming the game that you're talking about, I mean, if you look at what Haskell did and what Davidson did, they didn't stop at 2,000 for, to get the game. They, they continued to 3,000 for no reason that has anything to do with grades. So something is happening there. Uh, and I can't speak to my students, but when I look at what, what they have done, I, I feel it's very promising at least. Now, if it's a white paper and it's a paper from, from a journal, obviously more studies have to be made here to see why, why do they continue? They're, they're not gaming. Those students who go to 3,000 points from going to 2,000, they're not gaming the game anymore. They're doing or at least they're not doing it by our rules. Or, right? or at least they're not doing it by school's normal rules. Exactly. So, yeah. No, I, I think there's a whole lot of interesting stuff. I'd like to go back to, to, uh, to this idea of consent. Because I think this just might be because there's so many levels uh, of power at the same time in, in everything that we were discussing that I just didn't quite get it. Uh, but I'm going to argue later at the Living Games Conference in, in my talk about safety that consent is actually a slightly problematic term in any context that's co-created, including, by the way, sex. So this idea like, that, that consent is something that, consent means that I allow something to be done to me 
Whereas actually, in a role-playing situation, quite often we agree, we negotiate that we're going to do something together, which is why we're just this year at Nordics precisely started to talk about calibration mechanics rather than, for instance, consent uh, or safety in that, in that specific uh, situation. Because I think I worry that, or I mean, I just, maybe I, I didn't get it, but it feels to me like, like um, many aspects of power are uh, collapsed if you divide only between author, uh, authorial and aggregate. Because it's also about how collaborative um, the play styles themselves are in some way. Because I, I, I feel that there is a sort of ideological baggage in the term consent that has to do with power structures that are about deciding. Um, and I'm, I wonder what the learning, so, so I mean, is, it, is the point to say we're going to make a really hierarchical art where the game design is going to, to be like feudal society and then we're going to make another art where, where the game design reflects the other society because it would seem like another way of doing that would be to say okay let's use the exact same hierarchical game design and try to play different societies in that and then try to play the different societies in a different kind of game design because then we might learn more both about game design and society. Again, I'm not sure about oh, the, yeah. the question. Can you talk to me about consent? Really, we, we have to have a hallway discussion. Um, yeah. you know, going to consent, something I'm really excited about is opening it to the students to define what that is, how many layers are there. And I see that as something separate from the ethereal versus aggregate play slash power structure. Um, in, in terms of saying um, when this way of deploying power socially is bound to certain other attributes, how does that change consent? How does it change um, your ability to consent as a woman, for example, or in a sexual situation, if your ability to deploy a type of code fluency is tied to your gender? So there, there's a way of, um, of using consent as one term to talk about how power is deployed within the subjective model oh, of our okay. current society. You know, so it's like, get students to write about that and make those connections themselves, but I certainly won't be saying it would be limiting their scope of analysis. Okay, I may have misunderstood that, because I think I collapsed in my mind player agency and character agency. So, so the character's ability to consent in the different societies is quite different, and the player's ability right. to consent in different game designs is different. And, and one thing I should underline too, underscore, is that players would be observing other games. I'm not designing any new games for this. I'm taking them out into the community and or, or bringing in, in game designers to um, introduce students to pre-existing games, get them to an alliance game, get them to a, a legacies game, get them into these situations either as, as observers or players so they can feel this themselves and see how LARP has evolved in the United States, with the goal also being for the students to get that exposure and get that experience to, to pre-existing LARPs as a cultural phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, so, so definitely no new games, just looking at the structures that exist in freeform and campaign LARP already, and then making those comparisons while writing papers about it is the way I see this going, but mm -hmm. definitely should talk about No question. Do you have another question, Adam? Okay, so um, a, a follow-up is, is uh, for, for Mikhail on, on the, the question of points. Um, I, I, I find points to be ideological in this big capacity, and, and you know, you've got the practical problem of people also of gaming the system, but like, you know, I get kind of triggered by my whole career being measured, you know, in terms of points, although this is the way it's done. Is there <laughs> some, some way, uh, in which the, the, the point system is a necessary evil, or do you actually see it as, as I mean, you can also say, oh no, students are all about points and that's it. But, but do, do you see it as, as an intermediary to some other form of evaluation? Can of worms open it? Um, <laughs> no, but really, it, it's, it's a most valid and important question, and I would love for the conversation about teaching methods to get to that question. Okay. I've never been there myself, given uh, that I've been just about the only one working with this within the departments that I've been right. at. So I, I can't sit down with a colleague and discuss, you know, how many points should be for this quest? Because they're going to just look at me like I'm an alien. Well, well, I, 
I had to do all this alone, right? So I, I used them as a heuristic device. Uh, watch, and based on what Haskell has been doing uh, and the guidelines that came through 3D Game Lab, uh, has that been a decent approximation? I, I think I've done a better approximation of their learning uh, achievements than the letter-based grades that I've seen. Because the, the conversation, this is a really part, an important part here. We talk about, you know, what are the concepts that they're supposed to have learned at the end of the term? We never had that conversation in our departments. It's just, well, it's the 101 class, here's the reader, make sure they know the stuff, you know. And that's about as far as it goes. So in that institutional environment, getting to that level of, of sophistication, please, one day. Okay, okay. Do you have a comment on this? So there is yeah. some... Evan, I, I had queued up to drag, to, to try and get a hallway conversation with him about standards-based grading. If you'd like to be part of that conversation, we should... <coughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> so you're in the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have standards based grading instituted at your institution? Um, one of my colleagues is trying to, on a class by class basis, I'm still looking at it, but it's something I'm very interested in talking about. Okay. Is, it, is that the community college level where it's starting to creep in? Yeah, two, 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 okay. two words on a standards based, uh, like you explain sure. define standards based. So standards based grading is instead of using points, you know, even in a more traditional sort of way, it's a way of saying, okay, these are the concepts and skills that we want you to have learned. And depending on how you're doing this, it might be either a, you know, and be able to apply. And it might be either a check you have learned this or a you have somewhat learned this or you have mastered this. And um, the grade that you earn at the end of the semester is based on not how many points you got on exams, but how that has demonstrated your mastery of these concepts. And often, for example, you must get a base level of mastery of all of the concepts in order to pass the class. <coughs> um, and then the more, you know, higher levels of mastery of those concepts can you know, or, but you wind up having basically a point scale that is out of maybe 20 points for the entire class. It's just, you know, did you get a, set, a basic understanding or a mastery or not understand this concept? Can, can I just add one thing to you? Because that's one side, you know, the pedagogical side, how do we measure learning in, in a decent fashion. But the other side is also departmental politics uh, and the battle of the bell curve. Uh, I referred to Haskell and uh, Davidson, who both had 92% A's or 100% A's, which is fantastic, you know, when you look at that. But there is also a whole lot of pressure to retain the bell curve sort of shake-ishness. And in that environment, discussing learning achievement when there are people who just want to see a particular grade average for class, how can you do that? Uh, it's, yeah. I, I could talk to that at length, but... Okay. I just had a quick comment that I wanted to interject. There's a librarian named Scott Nicholson who does a, a, an interesting critique of gamification in all sorts of contexts, uh, and his uh, critique hinges upon the limitations of what we call black gamification, badge level achievement points, uh, and so he offers kind of an alternative model that actually sort of delves a little bit deeper into, you know, why are you doing this, uh, what is the experience of play that you're seeking to create, and, and things of that kind. It's worth looking up in the context of trying to introduce this sort of surface, surface level gamification into a classroom situation because of how it interrogates that. I was Scott there are some, there are some, well. some psychological studies also along those lines that argue that the badge point based gamification, the author called it zombification, essentially. Uh, if you want the reference to, the, to that paper, catch me later and I'll dig it out for you. I, I just downloaded it. No. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have for one more question? Yeah, 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 we need to get out. We'll put the link up. Well, thank you very much. Thanks to our speaker.